This is the first lecture from Chapter 7. Um, the title of the chapter is Quantum Mechanical Model of the Atom, but it's really all about the electron. First, a definition of quantum mechanics. Basically, quantum mechanics is a theory which bases the behavior of subatomic particles, like the electron, based on the wave properties of the electron. We're going to focus on the electron. Okay, so you'll see as I walk you through the development of our current model of the atom, which is called the quantum mechanical model, where wave properties fits in. It's very, very abstract, but I just want to introduce you to the concept. Development of the quantum mechanical model of the atom did not come about through one person's discovery. I guess you could say it officially started with Niels Bohr model of the atom, which you may remember Niels Bohr's primary contribution to the model is his finding that electrons are quantized. In other words, electrons can only exist in certain energy levels. And we designate those energy levels that electrons can exist in around an atom with these circular rings around the nucleus. So even though today we know that the Bohr model does not accurately describe the atom, the fact that electrons are quantized is still believed to be true today. And so we often use Bohr's model um, when we're talking about the different energy levels of electrons. And it turns out that by studying the energy gap between two different energy levels of an atom, we can learn about a lot about um, the energy level, the probable location and behavior of electrons. So, for example, let's look at an electron in a lower energy level and imagine that we provide energy to the atom. If it's the correct um, level of energy, an electron from a lower energy level will get excited, we call it, get excited to a higher energy level. Of course, it won't stay there very long. Everything prefers to be in the lowest possible energy state. So that excited electron will very quickly fall back down to its ground state level. And when it does fall back down to that ground state level, that extra energy is given up as light. If we measure the light that's emitted by excited electrons, that tells us about the spacing of the energy levels, and we learn more about the atom. We'll go into that in more detail later on in this chapter. So as I mentioned earlier, it's probably accurate to say that Bohr's model was the first step toward the current quantum mechanical model of the atom. Another major contributor is a scientist named Louis de Broglie. In summary, de Broglie said, or he theorized, that all types of matter could have wave-like character. Now, classically, we think of matter as simply a particle, not a wave. De Broglie proposed that there is wave-like behavior associated with all types of matter. And he actually proposed a mathematical equation to describe that wave-like behavior. And really all I want you to understand from that now is that the wavelength, this lambda sign, is wavelength. My pen isn't working very well. Okay, so the wavelength associated with matter is inversely proportional to the mass or the size of that piece of matter. And so if you're talking about something very big like us, a human being or a car or something, the wavelength associated with it would be very small. On the other hand, if you're talking about something with a very small mass, like an electron, a subatomic particle, the wavelength associated with it would be large enough. And it turns out that the wave behavior associated with electrons is in fact large enough for us to be able to observe indirectly. And so quite a few studies have been, on, um, have been done on the wave-like uh, 
property of electrons, and that was actually a very important step in coming up with our current quantum mechanical model of the atom. And so around the same time that de Broglie was proposing that matter has both particle and wave properties, Einstein was also proposing that light, which of course is not matter, light is a form of energy, Einstein proposed that matter, or excuse me, that light, which we thought of as having only wave-like properties, also, according to Einstein, had particle, could behave as a particle. And he called a particle of light, which we still do, a photon. And so you have these two um, very renowned scientists saying that both light and matter uh, can both behave as either a particle or a wave. And that was very revolutionary and, and a big step in the field of quantum mechanics. This is oversimplifying, but if you can imagine one of Bohr's energy levels around the nucleus, and you imagine trying to fit a wave function, so we've got electrons in these energy levels, right? So you imagine trying to fit a wave around so that it fits in this the diameter of this particular energy level perfectly um, not all wave functions would do that it would depend on the wavelength of that particular wave so if you could write an equation to represent a wave that fits perfectly in the diameter of a particular energy level you might think okay that that describes the wave function of an electron. So our next scientist, Schrodinger, did in fact that. He wrote out very complex, long mathematical equations um, to describe the wave behavior of electrons in an atom. And so he has these big mathematical equations, and I actually I used to put them on my PowerPoint. It would take up a whole page. <clears throat> and it turns out that when you graph the way Schrodinger's wave equations, you end up with these um, three-dimensional representations of the wave behavior of electrons. And so what we call these solutions of Schrodinger's wave equations today are orbitals. So it's important to understand what an orbital is. The rest of this is pretty abstract, but it is important to understand what an orbital is. An orbital is simply um, a 3D area of space where an electron is most likely to be found. So let's look at this orbital that we've labeled the 1s orbital. It's called a dot density graph, but basically the more dense the dots are, the more likely you are to find an electron. So if in, in an S-type orbital, uh, which are spherically shaped, you're likely to find the electron someplace in a sphere shape around the nucleus. Um, in a P orbital, which most people describe as dumbbell shape, you're likely to find the electron um, in a lobe um, above or below the nucleus or side to side. And so anyway, so if you get anything out of this uh, page, have it be the definition of an orbital. And so if we were to, it's hard to represent our current model of the atom. Um, graphically, but if we try, again, so this is the quantum mechanical model, which is our current model of the atom. That's important to understand that too. It's usually represented with one of these dot density di diagrams. So here's the nucleus in the middle, and this happens to be an S orbital that I've shown here. And I guess, again, it's really to emphasize that the quantum mechanical model of the atom cannot tell you exactly where an electron is located or exactly what its energy is, but it can give you a probability of where the electron is most likely spending its time. 
Um, and it's worth mentioning also at this point that we do not believe that electrons orbit the nucleus as Bohr and Rutherford proposed. Uh, we really cannot say exactly how an electron moves um, for various reasons, uh, but we can only talk in terms of probability and likelihood. So that's it for the first three lectures in Chapter 7, and the next lecture is more detailed information about the properties of light.